The story of alleged anti-Semitism in the Labour Party has never been far from headlines in recent years. Centred around Jeremy Corbyn's time as leader, many of you watching will be acutely aware of what's gone on, and some of you may have been victims of it. And let's be clear, it's nothing short of a witch hunt. The smearing of lifelong anti-racists as anti-Semites has taken many forms, from the hounding of Chris Williamson out of the party, to accusations against Corbyn himself, via the trashing of us at the Canary. Much of it has come from the establishment within both the Labour and Tory parties. It's also come from right-wing organisations, and the majority of it has been unfounded. There's been some incidences of this witch hunt that have been particularly disturbing. Jewish people have been branded anti-Semites themselves. These appalling acts have resulted, without irony, in people being effectively labelled the wrong kind of Jew. But we rarely hear these people's side of the story. Until now. In the second episode of the Canaries Frontline series, I'm bringing you an interview with Jackie Walker and Graham Bash that I recorded last July. We take a look at the situation in the round and discuss their stories. And we also hear how this pernicious and mendacious campaign has personally affected those involved and their families. We also discuss the implications for the left as a whole. So Graham, obviously we're talking about the Labour anti-Semitism witch hunt today and how this ended up impacting you and Jackie very directly and in a number of ways and I think rather than introduce you I'd really like you to kind of tell our audience who, who you are. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take a little step back and go back to my beginning because mm. I hope we can also explore our different experiences of racism, what brought us into anti-racist politics, what connects us, and also what still divides us. And the deeper we go on this, the more painful I suspect it will be, so let's do it. Now my starting point is being Jewish and my early experiences of anti-Semitism, which in many ways defined my life, certainly my political life. I remember I was six at school and I was told, my dad says Hitler should have finished the job, put you all in the gas ovens. You Jews killed our Jesus. And in later years of football, I'm a West Ham fan, West Ham fan singing, I've never felt more like gassing the Jews. And I internalized these experiences. Mm. And I, in preparing for this today, I, I remembered I had a recurring dream throughout my teens and my twenties. And in this dream, it happened dozens of times, I was surrounded by Nazi concentration camp guards and I knew they were gonna find out I was Jewish mm -hmm. and I knew what they were gonna do. They took down my trousers, they found I was circumcised and I knew I was going to be killed. And that oh, kind of entered into my consciousness. But of course, there's two main differences with what Jackie has suffered. I suffered prejudice, and I felt an outsider, but it wasn't structural racism that I suffered, and my difference isn't obvious or visible. Mm. I'm not deprived of power as a result. Now, this experience of racism, this kind of collective memory of the Holocaust, my feelings of being an outsider, lessons I learned from my father, who was uh, with the uh, people of the East End, the Jewish people and the dockers of the East End, fighting the fascists in uh, Cable Street in the 1930s. This led me into the politics of anti-racism, into the Labour movement. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, 51 years ago, I joined the Labour Party. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, heroic, I know. So I thought <laughs> I knew all about anti-racism. I was at all the big battles against the fascists, Lewisham in the 70s, Welling in the 90s, and even a few years back, the Battle of Dover. I even helped set up West Ham Fans United Against Racism, where we had many scary moments, I can assure wow. you. And then I met Jackie, and I learned how little I knew about racism. She taught me to see the world through her eyes, though I still have a long way to go. I'll give a couple of examples, if I may. One's totally non-political. Um, many years ago in a Dorset village, we were going into a pub, and Jackie said, 
you go first. I said, why? She said, because the moment I go in, everything will stop. There will be total silence. And I remember with some shame, me thinking, for God's sake, get a grip. Mm. And then we went through lots of laughing and shouting and then sudden silence. Mm. And I learned something that day. And then came the Labour Party and the witch hunt. And I saw firsthand through walking by her side what the effects were of structural race discrimination, the vicious mm. way it functions, what it's like to be abused, made silent and visible. There were various threats, violent threats in the social media to burn and maim her. There were sexual threats to rape. There was racial abuse. And some of this, I'm afraid, came from prominent members of the Labour Party. She was challenged to produce proof of her Jewish heritage. Inconceivable that this would be done to a white Jew such as me. She was challenged for not being properly back, black. Most brutally, she was vilified as a racist as, and as an anti-Semite. And I felt her pain when she walked out of her, her Labour Party hearing because of the racist material in the documents. When she reasonably asked for this material to be removed, it was refused. There were references to her being a white woman with dreadlocks. There were racist cartoons. And then these words, that she had an unhealthy obsession with the, um, with the African Holocaust. Imagine if this was said about the Jewish Holocaust. And I've suffered too. I've lost my family, my Jewish family. And as for Jackie, what she's gone through, she will speak for herself. But there's so much through these experiences that connect us, and yet there is still so much that is separate and different. That's just, it's such an incredible perspective. And I think one that will, I think, humble a lot of people to be able to hear that and reflect themselves about, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's a new experience I'm seeing at the moment with the, with the Black Lives Matter kind of waking white allies to a degree. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, you touched on systemic racism that Jackie was experiencing there. And obviously, Jackie, we're going to be speaking to you in a second about what, what the lived experience of that. But for listeners who maybe aren't as close to issues of racism, what is the distinction you're making between experiencing racism as someone says something nasty and systemic racism? What is the difference between those so people get it in their bones that, that these are different? Okay. I suffered prejudice and, and it hurts, but I wasn't part of the group that was put to the bottom of the pile because of the race or racial group or the religious group I was in. I wasn't disproportionately represented in the Grenfell fire. I haven't been the subject of being thrown out of the country because I came through the Windrush generation and didn't have the proper papers. I wasn't in the front line disproportionately being killed as a result of, of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I wasn't at the bottom of the pile when it comes to housing and education. I wasn't at the bottom of the pile. And that is what I mean by structural racism that actually deprives me of power because of my situation. I suffered in all other, in many other ways, mm. but not in that fundamental way. And of course, as I said, I can, when I walk, I live in Broadstairs. Mm. Now, Broadstairs is full of old geezers like me. And I, I, I walk down the streets, I see my fellow old, old geezers, they greet me as a brother. Mm. I'm, I look just like anybody else, mm. and Jackie doesn't. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And so now, obviously, we need to go and hear from Miss Jackie Walker. Jackie. Tell us about yourself. What was your journey to this point? Well, it was a very, um, you know, complex journey, as is the whole of my identity, as is the identity of many people from the Caribbean, because that's what defines us. We are not just black. We are not just white. We're not just one thing. And that's what makes it very often difficult to cope with the world that we're in. Um, so my mother came from the Caribbean 
but she was also of Jewish descent, although, um, you know, she was a practicing Christian, mm -hmm. but she always made me very aware of my Jewish heritage. My father was a white Russian communist who went to the United States escaping from the pogroms in 1918 and they met together in the civil rights struggle in the 1950s. And so, you know, I'm not just the product of people who've been enslaved. I'm not just a product of slave masters and those who are enslaved. I'm not just the product of people who have, have murdered and punished black people for even daring to learn to read and write. I'm also the product of the people's black and white who fought against that. And zip very speedily through what would otherwise be a very long story. I think that tells you something about the fact that to ask me to align myself with one group to the exclusion of another, to one genocide, to the exclusion or the, the, the putting down of another is asking me to cut myself not just in two. It's like cutting my heart out. Yeah. It's a fundamental denial, both of history and historical fact, and of who I am. And so coming to the Labour Party, and I have to tell you that from the time I rejoined the Labour Party, which was about 11, 12 years ago now, I faced racism. Mm. This, this, this experience isn't recent. Mm. And I think you'll find that with almost any black member you were to interview, so that I was actually physically attacked in my CLP. I was treated in ways without doubt that were structurally and actually racist. Mm. In spite of this, I did become vice chair. And I did kind of believe, I had that hope, that when Corbyn was elected, what we would see was a radical change mm. and that part of that radical change would be a revisiting of how black communities, black individuals are treated within the labor movement. Mm. And so I guess what I'd like to touch on next would be the issue, because you, you've alluded there to essentially what happened to you, but you were asked to pick a side by the witch hunt, by which we mean you were speaking and you were speaking about your life history. You know, you basically said what you just said to us here today. You know, this is my the complex interweaving of cultures that is my ancestral history. You know, there are people who enslaved, there are people who were enslaved, there are people who financed the slave trade, there are people who opposed it, you know, vigorously. And this is all a part of your history. So you get up in a meeting and you, and you are simply doing this, you are talking about the complexity of that history. And then what happened to you? Well, actually, it initially happened through a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. The Israel advocacy movement and what they are is what they say on the tin. You know, their purpose is not the truth. Their purpose is not about equality for all human beings. It's to advocate for Israel. And they dug up an old uh, Facebook post and took it out of context. And, of course, what we know, although we didn't know then, Mm. remembering I was one of the first. Mm. Not only was I one of the first, but I was the first to fight it yeah. as well. Um, they took this out of context. The Guardian took it up, you know, with their extraordinary biased reporting mm. headed up by a reporter called Jessica Elgott. Yeah. And it didn't matter what you did. It, it, you had no access. That's what you've got to understand. There is no access to the media. Mm. And so the, the, the kind of 
the balance that you kind of think works in our democracy, you very soon realise was not functioning. And, and to give you an example of what happened, on my first investigation, because actually on that charge, I was found no case to answer, although that's the charge they love to bring up. Because they always want to link me to Farrakhan. I mean, you know, link me to Farrakhan. I'm a bloody international socialist, you know, for God's sake. <laughs> but they love, but the, you know, but they, lo they actually love to do that because it's the big black boogeyman. Yep. You know, they, they do love that. But when I was in this investigation, the person who was asking the questions actually said to me, can you explain to me what the African Holocaust is? And my mouth kind of fell open because yeah. I thought you would actually think, wouldn't you, coming to do this kind of thing, you do a modicum of research. Well, mm. what the leak later report, of course, tells us is apart from the bias of the people doing this work, these people are very low level people, mm. you know? I suspect their knowledge, well, certainly I know, their knowledge of black history is virtually zero. Mm. And that is pretty much matched with their knowledge of any Jewish history that is outside of Ashkenazi history. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're being, you're mm -hmm. being investigated by people in a system who actually know nothing about the history they're talking about. And actually they don't care. Yeah. They don't care because they're there to find you guilty. That's yeah. the first thing. They are there to find you guilty. Yeah. I, I, when you think about that for a moment, can you, I mean, can you imagine being in a situation in t today where in almost any environment you could say, wait, there was a Holocaust in Germany? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, exactly. I don't know. Um, sorry, carry on. But that is actually the point, isn't it? Mm. So we have structural racism within the Labour Party, which hits against real ignorance about what these black people are and who they are. It's not surprising that, that black comrades are being suspended and prevented from taking office disproportionately for, as far as we, we can mm. see. Because actually the white people who have the control and the power in the Labour Party have not got a clue mm. of the background of the minorities that they're dealing with, apart from a very specific part of, of Jewish history, which again, I say, is the Ashkenazi yeah. history of Jewish people. And we should say for listeners, um, obviously this is a kind of white supremacy that we're deeply familiar with in the UK, but those of us who have actually spent time in Israel um, and got to know the culture there well, will know this is, this is a big problem in Israel as well about, you know, we call this country apparently a safe harbor for world Jews, not black Jews. Really not black Jews. The treatment, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go into it now, but I would say to people, go and research the treatment of Ethiopian and Afri other African nation Jews, the way they get treated by the by the state of Israel when they attempt to make Aliyah, when they attempt to go home for one of a for one of a better phrase. Um, and it's not just black Jews either, Mizrahi Jews also um, face this sort of treatment. So essentially we're seeing sort of almost like the worst elements of this apartheid culture added to English exceptionalism and white supremacy and served up to us really as a bullshit sandwich, which is what we've all been having to chew on for the last few years. And I can tell you, it did not taste good for those of us who have had to endure this. And Jackie and Graham have really endured more than most. Um, so this blows up. And I remember at this point, we didn't know each other. I mean, you know, Jackie, Graham, you know, we've met over the course of the last couple of years and really talking about our separate experiences of this. And we, you know, we, we didn't have a history prior to this. So I didn't know who you guys were. And I can remember first hearing about, about Jackie and thinking, oh my God, what's happened? Because the headlines are so glaring. It was labor activist denies Holocaust or labor activist, um, what was it? 
obviously accuses Jews of financing an African holiday. Like they just, it just goes on like these really like, yeah, you think, oh my God, like a bomb has gone off. And to just explain quickly for listeners as well, anti-racists, as, as a rule, we check our privilege and we check our prejudice. That's, that's part of what you take on when you become an anti-racist is you go, I can't not be racist. I've been raised in an endemically racist society. You assume that's, that's a part of you somehow. So you're actively constantly on the lookout for when that rears its ugly head. So when these accusations were made, not only were they weaponizing anti-Semitism itself, but they were weaponizing our anti-racist instincts too. Because our natural response is not to go, well, that's a deeply cynical campaign that, that you're doing there. Our very first instinct is to go, wait, what did I do? How, how yeah. could that be? And you that's want to do that. And they leapt on that. That's why it worked. That's why I'm, I'm pretty sure. That's why it worked so effectively with Corbyn. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's mo more than one reason why it worked effectively. And that's why it split the left, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that is still a problem because in a way, you know, you look at our enemies and they were going to use everything against us. I mean, we never knew how bad they would get, no. how many lies, how, how really deep into the mud these people would go, how many lives they would put at risk by the way that they behave. We didn't know that. But what we, what, what we underestimated really and we weren't prepared for is what would happen to the left or what is seen as the left of the Labour Party yeah. or even, for example, and you've just got to look at it now, the, you know, the so-called socialist group of MPs mm. who are silent, yep. silent and mostly craven on this matter mm. because they're terrified yeah. and they'll say yeah. things, you know, like that. But they won't come out and say anything because like in any witch hunt people are terrorized and terrified and that is how it's going to stay yeah until people stand up and tell them to stop this nonsense and go away and when we talk about people feeling you know being terrorized and terrified i think for a lot of people they that have been awake like not a part of it like they haven't really been woke to what's happening as it was happening they might be starting now to go wait i think hang on <laughs> um can you guys both describe really clearly for people like what actually happened like what what did this abuse look like what were you dealing with what was the frequency that you were dealing with it and what conflict did it create around you in terms of your, your relationships, your friendships, those sorts of things? Can I just again take a little step back? <clears throat> These allegations of um, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party hardly existed until Jeremy became leader. Yeah. And then it started. They, they tried to portray him as a Czech spy or an agent of Putin, but it didn't really work. And then they came, they decided to go with this allegation of anti-Semitism. Mm. And the thing is that it came from two different, connected, different sources. One was the right wing of the Labour Party, who had no interest in um, anti-Semitism, mm. but they wanted to find a stick to undermine uh, Corbyn with. They never accepted him as leader. Yeah. And secondly, there were the pro-Israel forces who were horrified at a pro-Palestinian possibly becoming Prime Minister, certainly leading the Labour Party. And the allegations began quite early on. And what was quite clear is that from my experience of 51 years of the party, of course there's anti-Semitism, but I've come across it once. And with social media, of course there's, there's some existence of it, as you would expect. It's 500, 600,000 members at one point. Um, going down a bit now, uh, of course there's going to be anti-Semitism, but it was disproportionately low, not high. Mm. And the point, and this is where it connects with, with uh, the question of anti-black discrimination, there was two real problems for us. One is that it obscured the real racism mm. in the Labour Party, but above all in society, which is the structural racism against black and Asian people. 
Mm. And secondly, of course, in the long run, this is very dangerous to Jewish people themselves. Yeah. Fake allegations do the Jewish people no good at all. And of course, it was used to obscure criticism of Israel. And they developed, and there was already one uh, pro-Zionist group, the Jewish Labour Movement, but they developed um, Jewish Voice for Labour, which was the voice of kind of Jewish socialist internationalists, which I uh, joined. And it told the truth. It told the truth about what the state of the Labour Party was, that this was totally exaggerated and distorted for political ends, and that it was being used to protect Israel from criticism internationally. It's becoming more and more uh, unpopular, and more and more the politics of uh, BDS, the boycott movement, uh, was becoming popular. So they were worried about that. And the problem is that our side, or some of our side, kind of gave in to that pressure. Mm. Now, I can understand why, because the forces from below, sustaining Jeremy and John and McDonald, all those people, were, were small. We hadn't built a sufficient base, despite the upsurge of membership. Mm. And it, was, it seemed easier. Can we give up on this and it will go away? And of course it didn't. Yeah. And then we had not just Jackie, we had the outrageous example of Mark Wadsworth at the launch of the Chakrabarti report, making the obvious point that black voices were silent and black faces were invisible at that launch. Mm. And then, as saying that, he gets himself expelled from the Labour Party. And then you get Ken Livingston. I've got my differences with Ken over the years, but probably the best anti-racist representative the party's ever had, being forced out and then Jeremy himself, a great anti-racist. Mm. Outrageous that he could be accused of anti-Semitism. I wanted to loop in Jackie on this because this is something that we touched on in our first, our very first conversation, which I think was maybe 18 months, two years ago. And we were on the phone and we were talking about it. And I was trying to get to what I was so upset about because I've been trying to explain, explain it to people. And Jackie had said, I tell you what's frustrating. This would never happen. You couldn't, you could not replicate this smear campaign with black people because the racism in our society is such nobody would have given a shit. And, I, and it was just like the way you explained it like that, it really hit a nerve for me about that is partly what I'm so angry about is that the very fact that they were able to use this smear campaign because anti-Semitism is so heavily st stigmatized in our society, in almost any group or situation, you wouldn't publicly at least want to be showing that, but you can still, I mean, you can be elected prime minister in this country, having called Muslim women letterboxes, having called black people picking the knees with watermelon smiles and be unrepentant about it, and not only that, let's face what's happened. He yeah. didn't just say that, apart from being sorry, during this point of Black Lives Matters, not one reporter has revisited those statements. Now, now think about what happened to Jeremy Corbyn, going yeah. over and over and over again, the same ridiculous concocted confections, but bringing it forward a bit, mm. I just also want to think of Sir Starmer's response to the Colston statue. Yeah. So that was that. And so can I just check in for you guys? Because we've spoken a lot about this theoretically, but you have both alluded to personal impacts of this. Yeah. Graham, you've spoken about creating distance between you and your own family. And Jackie, you, you've touched on how personally devastating an experience this was for you. And obviously I don't want to trigger people. I don't, you know, I don't want to force you to talk about anything you're uncomfortable with, but that which you are comfortable sharing with us, would you do that now to give people some insight into the damage that this witch hunt actually does? Can I, can I just say as well, it, you know, it wasn't just Graham's family that was affected by this. It was, it was also my family who was affected by this. I mean, you've got to understand that I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother. 
and I'm also people's friends and people's neighbors. And the fact that my sons and daughters had to see their mother being abused and threatened had not just a simple effect, you know, my parent is being threatened with physical violence, my mother is being accused of this or that. When you're a black person, this threat is on a much, much more visceral level. Physical racial attack is not a theoretical experience for me. It's happened to me. It actually happened to me. And it's happened more than once to me. It's not some distant ancestral um, uh, trauma that goes back to slave times, even though actually my great grandmother who looked after me as a child in Jamaica was actually born at the edge of slavery wow. and her mother was a slave. So when people say, yeah, but it was a long time ago. Well, actually in my, in my family, it's not a long time ago. Mm. It's pretty actually recent. So the effect on my family has been, it has been extraordinary. I mean, it's very lucky that my children don't have my names. And I never refer to their names. Mm. They work in the public sector, some of them, and I never refer to their names. Mm. But that's just the effect it had on my family, right? Now, you know, the effects on my political career, I don't actually give a damn about, is the truth. I don't mm. give a damn about it. But there is another far deeper effect. And it's, it's something that has left me traumatized. And I'd like to speak about that for a minute mm -hmm. because I've been talking to a lot of black people at the moment, not just activists, by the way, black people, about how this period when we have watched a black man being killed it taking nine minutes to kill this man. That being repeated again and again, people discussing it as if it's almost not a human life at times. How that impacts on you and as a black person is not the same. And this talks about the trauma of not just having been the focus for physical attack, not just learning to be a fast runner from school because if you didn't, you would be beaten up, mm -hmm. not just learning how to put out petrol bombs when they're put through your door as a child, not just seeing your mother die through poverty and through racism because the ambulance took 35 minutes to get to her, mm -hmm. This isn't just a narrative, this is my life. Mm. So when I am accused of racism, the effect of this on me is, to call it traumatic, is um, an understatement. Yeah. It's an understatement. It's actually abuse and it's racist abuse. Yeah, and and it's, it's narcissistic abuse as well, because it's, you know, what's happening is actually you're the victim in this scenario. And I'm not saying you're a victim, you're a survivor. But in this yeah. exchange, right. you are a victim. Someone right. is actually attacking you. And exactly. you know that. But, um, yeah. but everyone who's in a position to adjudicate on it, whether yeah. it's the party itself or the media or whatever, or the EHRC, you know, that when I did it, it's all of these bodies hope not hate, even the weaponization of anti-racist groups. It just, I mean, it's a joke. So you're there in the middle of this, you get attacked and hit really in, in what is about your deepest wound, because you're a person who has experienced attack over and over and over. And, and this is exemplified by this, the so-called hearing. 
which yeah. is actually a kangaroo court, which, you know, if you know your history of dictatorships, yeah. replicated those kind of courts to the exact degree. I mean, for example, in this room full of people, the Labour Party, by the way, I think had four legal representatives, barristers and solicitors, to speak their case. Then you had, then you had the board who were allegedly uh, judging your case, but you know, it, we knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, representatives from the trades union movement, whatever they were. Then you had note takers and all sorts of people. The only black person in the room, it would almost be a joke if it wasn't true, was the note taker who also doubled up as the person making the tea and coffee. Nobody noticed. Ugh. Nobody noticed except me. I was not judged by my peers. And then to have this legal bu bundle, which included racist cartoons about me and my hair. They've got a thing about my hair. Yeah. You know, racist cartoons with little signs of smell coming from my body. That being in their documentation mm -hmm. and asking that of, of the 210 or so pieces of paper that were evidence against me that they should remove the five so that when I came to responding, I wouldn't have to look at this racist material. And they refused it. They refused. And this is the party of equality. Yeah. How dare they? Yeah. I'm so, sorry, Graham, you carry on. But my experience, of course, is something far more indirect, far different. Um, I've had no physical fears at all, except once when I was with Jackie in Glasgow, soon after it started, and a woman came up to Jackie with her hand out, and I rushed in front, only for the woman to shake her by the hand and congratulate her for telling the truth. But it was obviously an internalised fear. For me, it's something else, and it... It's, it's nowhere near as acute, but it still hurts when you are told that you're being a traitor to your own people. Because the thing that I haven't discussed at all is my attitude to the state of Israel. Now, I'm a socialist internationalist Jew, and I take that seriously. So I'm against any state that gives me a greater right to live there in Israel than a dispossessed, ethnically cleansed Palestinian. So simple as that. I oppose, um, I oppose the uh, Jewish supremacy in the state of Israel. I think Israel should be a state of its citizens. So, um, with my family, and I am loath to speak about this, but there's been um, a tension throughout the years. My, most of my family are pro-Zionist, and I'm anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. But it has only really come up uh, to the point of break in this period. And I'll just say that, really. But what's also upset me has been the loss of some comrades on the left, mm. the softer comrades, perhaps, yeah. on the left, who have succumbed to some of this. Yeah. And I find that deeply distressing because we pointed out, I mean, the chickens are now coming home to roost, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. They are. Uh, they're coming home to roost. We said we are ignoring the real racism in society. We had little to say about it. We spent five years talking about something that hardly existed. <laughs> not hardly, didn't not exist, but it hardly existed. Yeah. Anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. When the real threat was right in front of us, staring us in the face, we were largely silent. And when Mark Wadsworth, again, someone I've had loads of differences with, but mm. when he has the temerity, I suppose, to point out the bleeding obvious, he gets expelled. And this is what, sorry, I mustn't start trembling again with rage, but how has it affected me? I, it's, it's left me not fearful. It's left me deeply sad, actually, mm. because it means that an opportunity of a lifetime, mm. which was the Corbyn-led Labour Party, has been squandered 
not entirely or even mainly because of these allegations, but it played its part. Mm. And I really regret that that is the case. And I'm just pleased that some of us, a number of us actually, spoke the truth from the beginning. But it doesn't yeah. really make it any better because we've been defeated. And yeah. It's I'm a bit like being Cassandra, isn't it? This whole thing is, you know, you're saying all along, we know exactly where this is going to go and what the price is going to be for us and all of you. Please stop going along with this nonsense. And then you just watch it continue to snowball. It's like a burning of books, you see. that People are trying to censor history. Yeah. Now, Ken Livingston spoke, for instance, about the Havara Agreement, in which some German Zionists supported the breaking of the blockade of Nazi Germany uh, in order to assist people and capital getting to, the, um, getting to Palestine to build the Jewish community there. Now, it, perhaps Ken shouldn't have said the exact words he said at that particular time. I'm not really bothered. Um, what he did was essentially to tell the truth. Mm. And by censoring history, we are burning books. And of course, the thing I've pointed out is that we've got to, Jewish people have got to speak about their own history honestly. Mm. But if we censor our own history, we also silence other people's history. We mm. silence uh, the voice of the, African, uh, uh, the Africans in the slave trade Mm -hmm. and their descendants because we obscure and silence their voices and we silence Palestinian voices if we cannot tell the truth about the state of Israel and it's so serious because we know what happens when you burn books yeah and that's perhaps one of the most frustrating things about this isn't it is that the this this whole campaign was sort of the biggest act of projection I think you could you could almost come up with is that people defending an inherently racist project, which is to say that this piece of land, despite the population being at least half Muslim, is going to be a Jewish state, and we're going to ethnically cleanse, ghettoize, you know, whatever we need to do to maintain the Jewishness of that state and consider it a token democracy. We're going to do. And so, you know, Jews, Muslims, black people, white people from around the world say, wait, this is not okay. This is not okay. This is not the answer to the Holocaust is to create another Holocaust. No, 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 no. I don't think this is what never again meant. Never again meant never again for anyone. And simply for taking that stand, you are then literally, not figuratively, literally called a Nazi. Yeah. Literally called a Holocaust denier. Yeah, literally called an anti-Semite. I mean, it, it is just breathtaking, the, the well, cynicism of that. It's strange to, um, I've never, thank goodness, been called a Holocaust denier, but if, it, mm. if I were, it would be strange. I spent the whole of the lockdown becoming more and more obsessed with learning about the, the, the Jewish Holocaust in Germany, mm. because there's so many lessons to be learned from it which another time perhaps, but I'm pleased to go through it. And I've been spending the last four months reading book after book after book on the, on the Jewish Holocaust, which is so rich in lessons, almost impossible to get one's head round, but that's what we must do. So it isn't true, of course. And some of those, some of those especially Jewish comrades I can think of, who are so singled out, are those with the greatest knowledge of the Jewish Holocaust. Absolutely, absolutely. As Jackie touched on earlier, I mean, one of the benefits that the witch hunt perhaps had is the general historical ignorance of, of, our, of our society and its, pre its existing prejudices towards black people and to and to brown people. And, you know, we saw that I can remember articles written by, you know, the Guardian columnist, you know, the Nick Cohen's explicitly saying Corbyn is being anti-Semitic to gain the Muslim vote. Like just the worst Islamophobic, that is a racist assumption about Muslims that they inherently hate Jewish people. And the idea that Corbyn is, is being anti-Semitic to, to get these, I mean, how is that different from the sorts of propaganda we saw at the beginning of the Holocaust that preceded and enabled the Holocaust that created this ethnic group, this religious group, this group of people, as untermenschen, as less 
than human, as subhuman, not a part of our civilizational standards, and therefore inherently dangerous. That is exactly the atmosphere that this witch hunt created around black people, around brown people, and around allies who dared to actually put their head above the parapet and be unwilling to go, to go along with it. Which I think brings us neatly to the labor leaks because now people have grasped exactly what has happened. You guys have gone through all this and remember, Jackie and Graham are two people. Their story is horrific, but this was replicated across thousands of people. There were literally thousands of people that were targeted by this campaign, slandered, defamed, kicked out of the party, lost their jobs, fell out with family, had their character assassinated publicly. This was a big, big smear campaign and it carried on for four and a half years. So this is a long, horrible time. Then the election is lost in 2019. So now kind of a lot of people who had been enduring a lot of horrible things with the hope that at least at the end of it, there would then be a Corbyn government and it kind of it would have been worth it to some degree. Now that's gone. And in the wake of this, in the middle of what is a crushing, devastating moment, we get an over 800 page report that lays out that this group of cynical staffers within the party and a few head honchos deliberately sabotaged the party from inside. This is not like someone else's summations. This is their own words. <laughs> there's, there's, we've got all these messages, basically, of them communicating with each other in this report. And you see exactly what we saw at the time, which was the relish with which these people went after black and brown people in their own party. The relish they felt at the idea that they were going to lose the party, the 2017 general election, and their devastation when they failed. And actually, <laughs> Corbyn did a lot better than, than they had, had intended him to do, and was actually only about 2,000 votes from becoming the Prime Minister of this country. 2,000 votes. That's what happened with the Labour Leagues. From your perspective, how did you feel when you saw those, those leaks come out? Can I, can I just say something, and I'm gonna slightly kind of correct something that you said. Mm -hmm. because I think the impression you give is that this was a small group of people mm -hmm. within the Labour headquarters. Now, it was a small group of people- But it was who, networked, yeah. Actually, if you look to who they were referring to, their power base was pretty big. Yep. And took in some people, and I can't name them, but anybody who's read the report knows how high this goes and how wide it is. And the fact that, as far as I can see, many of those people have some kind of shadow position at this point. Yeah. And that's the shocking thing. So now, just to I... clarify that for people who, who might not understand what Jackie means by shadow position, this means that since the Labour report is leaked, people identified in that report as actually being responsible for this witch hunt ha have now been promoted within the party. You know, staffers have been promoted to more senior positions. MPs are now holding shadow cabinet positions. So this is serious. This is, this is really serious. Now, in a way, I wasn't surprised. Because mm. uh, this is what I was experiencing. I had no idea, neither did my solicitor, why it took two years to get me in front of a hearing. While this was going on, can you imagine what my life was like? It was like being hung out to dry. I would turn the radio, my name would be on it. I'd look at a newspaper, my name would be on it. And they did that, and this is what the report says, they did it on purpose. They did it on purpose to cause the maximum damage to Corbyn, and they did it on purpose because they wanted Mark Wadsworth's case to go ahead. And I think it was Ken Livingston's as well, mm. case to go ahead before mine to make sure that I was found guilty. Mm. This is the party of equality. This is supposedly a party that is going to bring justice 
to this country. This is the party that has now a leading human rights barrister mm. as its leader. And what does he do when he gets this? When he gets this filth, which includes the most un awful racist abuse against MPs, what does he do with it? Does he suspend those people? Does he speak about the unacceptability about that abuse? Mm. Not a, not a whisper. Mm. He protects the roles of those people and he then sets up an inquiry with people heading it who he knows are the enemies of the victims of that report. So I wasn't surprised. What I was um, really interested in was the way that he, uh, Starmer could do this with the report and then so rapidly castigate and dis discipline the black MPs who had been themselves abused by the Labour Party in that report. I suppose, you know, we would call it chutzpah. I mean, this man who has the media behind him because of his rapier style, I don't, I don't understand the rapier Forensic. Stuff. He's forensic, Jackie. Forensic. All he has to do is open his mouth, and apparently it's forensic. <laughs> but this man, who is a human rights lawyer and steady in, somehow is silenced mm. on black racism. And yet, the first thing he did when he came into office was contact what is laughably called the Jewish community groups who were insisting on regulations that if, if this had been Russia or China, mm. the Starmer would have been objecting to as offending people's human rights and freedom of speech. And that is what we're into at the moment. Yeah. At Let me use a different word to Jackie. She always laughs when I say it in relation to her. Uh, when I'm really angry, I say I'm disappointed. Um, and I would say I'm disappointed, I'm disappointed in the Labour Party. And um, here is a clear cut case, it seems to me, of not just racist, by the way, not just racism, but sexism mm. um, towards, uh, towards black women Labour MPs. Mm. And not only are the um, perpetrators of this not suspended, which you would expect as a matter of urgency to protect the party. But actually the initial focus was on, oh my God, how come this got out? Yeah. Who was the whistleblower? So in other words, it's, it's actually shooting the whistleblower, not the perpetrators of this. So I'm not surprised either. But again, it shows once again, we have taken our eye off the ball. This is something that is, I'm afraid, what the left failed to do um, in, the, in our really critical four to five years of Jeremy's leadership. It had two enemies from within. Mm. It had the Parliamentary Labour Party, yep. and we failed to go for open selection of MPs to transform that Parliamentary Labour Party. And we had we had the national and regional offices full of people who were not sympathetic to Jeremy's and the, and the memberships project. And they felt, I'm afraid, to transform that, yeah. that, that those offices and, and the party. And we will regret that for many years to come, I think. So, yes, I look forward to the, re I look forward to the report of, uh, I look forward to the report on the report. <laughs> I'm not holding my breath. I am, as I say, disappointed. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like we're going to get anything. And I think it's at this point, I have to actually include a clip. So we've got, Keir Starmer is kind of infamous at this point for having a very dry delivery. Um, you know, he doesn't animate um, particularly well, whatever the issue is that he's speaking about, he's exactly the same. He's kind of nasally. 
But I listened to a clip of him and I'm literally two seconds in before I'd clocked what the clip was about. I actually thought, wow, he sounds really passionate. Like he's angry. It's like he, the real Keir, this is the real Keir Starmer. Like this isn't performative Keir. Do you know what he was talking about? He was defending the staffers identified in the labor leaks. Yeah. He was insisting that he would not do anything except protect those members of staff. And it just struck me that before I'd even realized that that was co what the conversation about, I had noticed a level of authenticity and passion in him that I had never seen before. And it turns out it's to protect the very people that are on the record racists, like on the record anti-black, anti-Palestinian racists. How do you feel safe in a party with a guy like that? It's shocking. Well, I think this is a really good point to make because I think that the Labour Party is not a safe space for people of colour. Mm. I really, and that, that I find really hard to say because, by the way, I'm not saying that the Tory party is mm. or the Liberal Democrats or anywhere else. And what's really marked at the moment with all this Black Lives Matter stuff going on is nobody is talking about how this relates to politics and the structures of politics. And I could not say to anybody, I now sound like the panorama documentary, that ridiculous, <laughs> awful panorama documentary, but how could anyone advocate to black people that this should be a party that they should join or that mm. they could feel safe in when what we see is racist being protected, mm. anti-black racists being protected and black MPs being abused by people in such high and official positions. I think you should ask Graham that as a white person. I think, I think, I mean, Graham is a, you, you know, Graham is a white member of the party. Would you say to a black comrade that the Labour Party is a safe space for them? Without doubt, I would say that it wasn't a safe place for them. Now, if you're going to ask another question, which is, would I say be in the Labour Party? I probably would with some reservations because all attempts to create electoral alternatives to Labour throughout the 120 years of its existence have gone nowhere. Now, I totally accept that the kind of bureaucratic Labour Party road of general, general committees and wards and, and all of this isn't going to be the central point at this moment because Labour failed under Corbyn because there wasn't a sufficient movement from below. We need to build the resistance. We're at a critical moment now, not only with Black Lives Matter, but with the, with the, um, the pandemic, and above all, the economic crisis, and even beyond that, the climate crisis. Mm. It's almost as if the future of the planet is at stake. Mm. And there's a massive movement that's got to be built, a massive movement of resistance, but ultimately, that's got to be given a political, even a, some kind of parliamentary electoral expression. And um, at the moment, that means the Labour Party. So I think that the best thing to do is to be in the Labour Party, but to recognise that we're going to get nowhere until we've built that movement, that resistance from below. And um, frankly, I think it's a matter of urgency. There's all of these crises, the economic, uh, the, the the climate, the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is an enormous step forward in many ways, this Black Lives Matter, of course, mm. because it's forced, it's forced into our uh, into political discourse, something that has, that has been made invisible, that despite the best efforts of the Labour Party in the last five years to relegate it to other forms of racism. Uh, mm. Do you remember the Chakrabarti report? Okay. Um, anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. Okay. So all of that, it has forced its way into the front pages, into a central part of our narrative. What a wonderful 
thing, therefore, that so many representatives of the slave trade are having their statues destroyed, absolutely correct. And all of this is necessary, with the opposition, of course, of, of Keir Starmer, I, I have to say. But all of this is absolutely necessary, uh, but it still needs to be given political expression. So in answer to your question, is the Labour Party a safe place for black people? Certainly not. No. And um, it, you touched there on the on the Colston statue. Obviously, that's particularly pertinent to me as I am a Bristolian, as you people can probably tell from my wonderful West Country accent. Um, it was interesting. I, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about this because I literally two days before that statue went in the water, I'd a friend was talking about this on Facebook and I out of nowhere, I've never said this before. I, I don't even think I thought it before, but I said, we need to throw that fucking thing in the sea. <laughs> like, it was just like this explosion of like, I am done. Like, I am absolutely done. Pick it up and toss it in the sea like he did to us when he was enslaving us hundreds of years ago. So, <laughs> so it was realising that what was happening at a society level was really and truly a manifestation of thousands of people being individually done accepting this status quo done being gaslit into using proper channels when yeah. they're already in control of the proper channels so they know yeah. if they can keep you diverted diverting your energy that way it's just wasted energy it just keeps you yeah. going around um and i i mean jackie you, you guys must have been like me very watching in a very fascinated fashion as to how Keir Starmer and this new centrist Labour Party was going to respond to this moment. And, and how, can you just... <laughs> Oops, can we say this and keep them satisfied at the same time? But whoops, we don't want anyone pointing a finger at us, so we better be a bit careful. You mean that little term? Yeah, that turn. Can you describe for people, like, what did they, what, how did he respond? How did the party respond? And, and what was your thinking about it? Well, what they tried to do was go, <coughs> we're the kind of, we're the grown-ups here. And uh, we have to, because we are the representatives, say that people shouldn't take these matters into their own hands. But of course, what they knew was that, and this is where it relates to what Graham was saying, that the mass of pressure from underneath was not going to be happy with that. Mm. And to some extent, you know, they're not speaking to black members mm. and they're not speaking to black yeah. people. That was very clear mm. in what, what he actually said. Yeah. Because had he been speaking to black members or black people, he would have known that they would have been saying, this is bullshit, shut the up. Yeah. He didn't need to do that. And that tells you something where, where black people stand, not just for Starmer, mm. but for the Labour Party. He is not talking to black people. Yeah. He's talking about black people. And that tells you all you need to know mm. about this Labour Party regime. So yes, I had this wonderful thing that I posted up on my, on my Twitter page and it said something like, you know, uh, this would be like, like somebody saying to Luke Skywalker, no, you shouldn't have destroyed the Death Star. You should have gone through the proper channel <laughs> and applied to the local council for it to be taken down. This was somebody who by himself had seen to the murder of 20,000 people. Now that doesn't even tell you all that he did. Yeah. And for then these arguments to come back about his philanthropy, I mean, that blows my mind. The philanthropy was the money he got for committing genocide. Yeah. That's what it was. And actually what we saw, of course, was the impossibility for Starmer to actually talk about those issues or get passionate about those issues. Yeah. So, I mean, as a black person, you just look at him and you just go, you are not interested in us. Uh, you have no connection to us. 
and you know nothing about our history and you care less about it. Yeah. I'll say the same thing in a different way. I was disappointed again, and I think that they were behind the curve. But what was wonder what's been wonderful about this movement is that it is actually black and white. Yeah. And it isn't ghettoized. And the point that we've always got to keep making is there's these different levels, layers of struggle. And our task is to connect them and not separate them. And what was beautiful that brought tears to my eyes and that wonderful image of that young black guy with the racist white thug over his shoulders saving his life. Mm. If there's an image of the, this beautiful movement, it's that beautiful image. And it's, it was magnificent, but it is that unity. And now we've somehow, God knows how, got to build, you know, all of us have got a responsibility to build from that movement and build this resistance. And I'm afraid we're going to have to, the relationship between that and the Labour Party, that's the, that's the issue. This movement of resistance has got to be a battering ram to batter down the gates that have been erected on the Labour Party. Mm. It's, it's just such a time to be alive, isn't it? It's such a time to be alive. I mean, this is, it feels like a number of Cold Wars have turned hot all at the same time, <laughs> you know? and you sort of, as, as daunting as that is, you're, you're fighting on all of these different fronts. I don't know about you, but I'm much happier now being in an open declared war than quietly having to endure this while being gaslit by people who were telling me it didn't exist. Like, I mean, one, uh, one of the problems, wasn't it, when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader, is that many of us felt that we had to maintain discipline. Yeah. Even when we saw him doing things that was just like, oh, for goodness sake, Jeremy. Even when we saw him not doing things where we knew mm -hmm. it would lead to total, utter defeat. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now, in a way, particularly me, I'm not in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to feel any loyalty to any particular group of people on this. But one thing I do think is really important is that, and it's something I've been speaking about on my Facebook page, we really must stop harking back to Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. We really must stop prefacing everything with the best prime minister we never had, or if only. There is a point in talking about it, the point is to look at it, to see what worked and to see what didn't work. And then we need to drop it and move on. Jeremy, I'm afraid, is in the past. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can see, he is not going to be relevant to what is now, in any real terms, a vacuum of leadership mm -hmm. on the British left. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see the new leaders emerge because they're gonna. It's gonna happen. Yeah, um, and I think. Sorry. Discipline, even if you're outside the structures of the party. If we're trying to construct an alternative form of resistance, we've got to still have discipline. We're all. We're not just individuals, and we've got to look after each other. And we've got to. You know, that's. We've got a collective discipline. So I'm. Of course. I, I think it's important to say that. Um, being outside the Labour Party, you are at the moment, perhaps one day I will be, perhaps even for being on this Zoom meeting I'll be. But it well, won't, actually, can I just say, people, hold on, for people who don't know, theoretically, according to um, the agreement that Keir Starmer has come to with the Board of Deputies, Graham Bash, my partner, could be expelled yep. for sharing a platform with me. I did actually tweet to the Board of Deputies and ask them whether it was all right for me to share his bed or whether he would be expelled for that. But they didn't come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's 
a good moment for us to move into the last element of this because we spoke a little bit earlier about the idea that we figured out quite early in this process the this witch hunt where it was going to end we knew we kept warning the party over and over don't throw these members to the wolves because the wolves will then be more full more powerful and then they're going to come and eat you and so you're going to have two issues then you're going to have a whole pack of strong wolves after you and your allies are dead so stop for the love of god please yeah. stop and reconsider your strategy and obviously yeah. that fell on death ears and the same process of appeasement continued until and beyond um jeremy's leadership of the party yeah. and so i just wanted to touch on two things that have now happened that have essentially proven us right but also proven that this isn't over it did this this witch hunt did not end the day that Jeremy Corbyn left power. It has just been trying to figure out how it is now going to implement its power moving forward. So I guess what I wanted to touch on first is the this campaign against anti-Semitism. I mean it's a ransom note, really. It's, it looked like a ransom note to me. So so Graham, how did you how did you feel seeing that seeing that letter? So um, I got something wrong. For years and years I was saying this witch hunt is not against Jackie Walker and Ken Livingston. Its real target is Jeremy Corbyn and it won't stop until they got rid of him. And of course I underestimated it. They've got rid of him and it's continued. And why is it continuing? Because the Corbyn legacy, if you want to use those terms, it's not a good term really, of 500, 600,000 members, most of whom are on the left, are still here. And they want to get, they want to degut the party of the vital part of its membership. Mm -hmm. So they, it will not stop, I'm quite convinced, unless and until they manage to do that. But there's going to be resistance. Um, people aren't just going to lie down and be expelled. People will fight. People will actually resist. There's, there's, we're going to build a movement from outside. There will be legal actions when they break, break their own rule. And let's just be very clear, just coming back to one point. You say that Keir Starmer says that me being on the same platform as Jackie is not acceptable because uh, it's because of the 10 pledges from the, um, from the Board of Deputies. But of course, that is, of got, that is of no legal worth at all because it hasn't been incorporated into the rules of the party. So I'm totally confident that uh, just by appearing on the same platform as you, Jackie, I'm not putting myself in danger. But if they try to expel me for that, then bring it on because it will be challenged. And just to be clear, that is the premise with which the CAA is demanding that Diane Joe and and the others are basically they want to call with Jackie. You know, Jackie was part of, <laughs> part of a Zoom call. Can I ask Graham something then on the back of that? If you're, and I think quite rightly, confident that this is not part of Labour Party rules, and it would be very hard for it to become legally part of Labour Party rules because of human rights issues. Why then did uh, Bell? and Diane, uh, when they were reprimanded for having been at a meeting where I was in the audience, why did they back away from that? Because they're in a different position. They are, had the fear, I'm not going to comment on their position by the way, it's too easy for me from outside to criticise them, but they were in the position of being MPs, they could have had the whip removed. Uh, which would have been subject to different rules entirely. Uh, that, um, so I, that's why, that's what they were afraid of. Now, would I have done the same as um, them? No, but then I'm not in their position. No, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I'm some, it's not even that, to, that um, the, the 10 pledges would be in breach of human rights legislation. That may or may not be the case. The point is it's not part of the Labour Party rule. That's the point I'm making. He will change that. But what I'm, I think it's really important that, that people understand what the pressure would have been on those black women MPs mm. who had just read a report 
where one of them, who is the most abused MP in history, what, what pressure mm. would have been put on them? Because like, you have to understand the obscenity mm. of what Keir Starmer did at that it point. It was obscene and the threat to them was the loss of their parliamentary career. And in terms of the younger one, someone who had just got into parliament. So I understand the pressures and the tragedy is that there isn't a movement from below that could have sustained them to enable to tell the leadership to go stuff on themselves. There isn't that movement from below. They would have been fighting on the front line alone. And sometimes you have to do that. That's what Jeremy and John and the rest did for five years. And look how they suffered. So um, that the pressures were all from the top against them. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make. That's not saying I agree with it, but I understand, and we haven't got a movement that can say, you fight, we'll back you, and we'll win. The irony of this situation, isn't it, Graham, because I agree with you on that, is that have they done that at yeah. that point, in the light of Black Lives Matter, actually Starmer could, would have had to have climbed down, mm -hmm. and Bell and Diane would have become the parliamentary leaders mm -hmm. of that movement, and that we have to understand as a lost opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see where this goes from here, because I've got to be honest, I'm with Jackie. I, I think, you know, I felt like that, not just with Belle and, and um, Diane Abbott and Dawn, but long before this with the whole thing of like realizing very early on, appeasement doesn't work. These people are bullies. All bullies are cowards. Fight them. We'll win. Like, we're braver than they are. We've got truth actually on our side. Like, what is the point of, of continuing to appease these people who are clearly permanently hostile? This is not a good faith argument here where you're like, well, I'm sure we can negotiate. This, this is not the type of people you're dealing with. I, I agree with both of you, by the way. I'm sorry if I gave the wrong impression. No, I no, see. you're not. I'm just, I'm trying to... I'm just yeah. not. I'm just not condemning them from outside. Yeah. I've done with what so I'm, doing. so what, here's the here's where the issue is, though, Graham, where it affects us personally. I think this is why I think there's a slight nuance between them, and I think perhaps you can only feel this way if you're a woman of colour, or if you know. It, I, I think that might be a part of it, actually. But it is it is knowing that they undermined our own bloody case it, by not, not fighting. They made it harder for us to fight. And it's not just that, it's not just that. These people who are going after the Bells and the Dianes, they always just happen. They always just happen to really victimize black women. Yeah. It's, it's extraordinary how that works. When you think of the paltry things that I have said, the little misspeaking terms of conversation yep. that I've missed. You compare that. Mm -hmm. You compare that with what others. And yet I have become such a target of yep. hatred. And then you tell me that this hasn't got, their targeting of, of black women has got nothing to, I mean, of course it's misogyny as well, mm -hmm. but that it's got nothing to do with racism. Do you remember where we started? We, I said, Let's examine our different experiences of racism, see where mm. it connects us, and see where the points of disconnect are. Now, Jackie said something, we, ha we have these di discussions all the time. God, I hope that the uh, Secret Service isn't listening. They would get bored to tears to our phone call. <laughs> Jackie said, now this is interesting, Jackie said, you speak with all the limitations of a white man. And my response was, and I prefaced it by saying, this is not, there's not an equal sign, but you speak with all the limitations of experience of a black woman. In other words, we can only speak from the limits of our experience. It's, we can go beyond it for our reading, for our connections, but there's limits. And there's, we're both limited. I'm more limited than you, because being more oppressed, you can be more universal. Can I, can I just nonetheless, say, can nonetheless, I, we're both limited, and that's why the point of connection and collectivity is the only way forward. Can I just say, because this, this is really crucially important, mm. the beginning of that conversation which you've missed off, and that's really important. I was really upset 
I was upset to the point of shaking with yeah. rage and crying when I heard Starmer's response. Yeah. And Graham said to me, oh, for God's sake, it's Starmer. What would you expect from him? And I said, that's the difference. That's the difference. For you, you can just go, it's Starmer. For me, it's racist abuse and it hurts me here. Mm. And that was the front of that conversation. You know, because racist abuse isn't just the things that you say, not just causing, calling people's names. You know, it's also a mission. Yeah. It's also the fact that you judge one group of people differently to another. And when I'm shaking with rage, it's not because Starmer mm. is, is somebody who is this rabid, frothing racist. Mm. It's because to me, he embodies structural anti-black racism in one. Almost everything he does within the narratives of race, from his meetings with the Jewish community groups mm. to the different ways that he treats different groups of minorities, to the way he speaks about statues, says it all to me. But as a white person, I can say that's just Starmer. Mm. That's just it. But for a black person, I can't say that. It's an yeah. injury. And have left out his appalling position on Kashmir as well, but leave that aside. Oh, great. That is, I mean, it has been a, it has been a non-stop, I mean, for, to use Graham's term, it's been a non-stop disappointment. The point, Matt. You know, I think anyone even who had some limited hope that this was going to be anything other than a full return. In fact, you could argue this this is worse than Blairism, what we're, what we're seeing with this the, with the centrism now, and I don't even want to make a case for it. It's bad, and it's bad in the same ways that Blairism was bad, because it's people of colour generally who get thrown under the bus to in the, in the name of some sort of project. It's as if, yeah. like, we've got to sacrifice ourselves. Like, all oh, right, you know, we're not going to get, um, you, you won't be treated like a human being, but, 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 show start. Um, but, 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 free school meals. And it's like this trade-off is placed before us. Like, if you want anything to get even marginally better, then you need to accept that you're at the back of the queue. Yeah. But Carrie Ann, I'm sorry, but this was also what was happening under Corbyn. It was. I, I remember. It was. I, I remember when they did this thing and they said, we're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to hold a commission on anti-Semitism. And then there was pressure. And so they added, and other forms of racism. And I remember arguing with some very eminent Jewish anti-racists mm -hmm. who were saying, well, you know, this is a reasonable thing to do because anti-Semitism is a special form of racism. Mm -hmm. And I said, you do this and it will be a wedge that will open up. And what will happen is that you will push black racism, anti-black racism, down what is already a pretty steep hierarchy. And that is exactly what happened. Yeah. And when I was speaking off the record to a number of people, they said exactly that. You know, what's important is that we get in. Just wait. We'll deal yeah. with in a bit yeah absolutely and it, it wasn't even just i mean i can i mean it was happening at the time but i feel like the morning after that election result was like all of the white supremacists in the labor party and the, and all the bigots in the labor party got together and said let's just turn ourselves on maximum volume now yes. and it was suddenly black people's fault that, that jeremy lost the election um, yeah. because they didn't curry favor with racists racist white working class people enough if we'd have only been more racist we might have got somewhere and this yeah, i can see I, you know, people would learn to be better racist yeah then they would be causing us so much problems and that's where of course you have the link with the palestinian absolutely that's why they cannot bear it yeah because we know what it's like to be treated like palestinians 
Yeah. And when, you know, when we look at all their pretend games that they play, you know, the Board of Deputies had this big fanfare this week. They're having their own little commission. It's a fashion oh, now. You have a commission. But you know what they're looking at? Oh. They're looking at the way that Jews, by the way, they mean white Jews. Right. But the way that the Jewish community, i.e. the white Jewish community, <laughs> deal with black Jews. Now you could ask the question, and I know the answer and I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they asking the question, how does the Jewish community interface with the black community? Mm -hmm. They're not gonna ask that question. Mm -hmm. It is really a thing. And that's kind of where we are at now is that we have, you know, the, the place this story has reached is that Keir Starmer has now received this ransom note and is going to have a decision to make. And that decision is probably not going to be allowed to be too far in the future because we know how this stuff escalates and how quickly it escalates. We can expect a whole smear campaign now. But Carrie Ann, do you actually think he's going to suspend Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, given actually, if Jeremy Corbyn was an ordinary member yeah. or Diane Abbott, he, they would all be suspended. Yeah. But they're going to be. I, do you know what? I can't even call it anymore because the amount of times I've gone, this can possibly happen, and then it has, has now happened enough that I'm kind of like, you know what, I'm just going to keep my powder dry and just see how this one pans yeah. out. But either way, I think it's it's going to be interesting I, I, because this issue isn't going to go anywhere. Um, and I think now you have a situation where the Labour Party is actively moving in the opposite direction of almost all of its membership and actually a big chunk of the public now. Because ironically, about six months too late, a big chunk of the British public has actually suddenly realised we are in a culture war. We are actually facing fascism and we need to unite and we need to unite as allies together and we do need to literally fight. This is not nicey-nicey, um, mild political differences time. This is fascists marching the streets talking yeah. about killing black people time. So we need to be a lot more serious, a lot more intentional about it. Just at the point that, <laughs> that our kind of political avenue to, to doing something about that in the in the short term has basically been neutralized yeah. you know I, I appreciate that people want to stay in the Labour Party and I appreciate their efforts because I do think those efforts bear fruit to some degree I do think that people in the party should be doing everything they can to drag it as left as possible but I don't know about you guys but if someone says to me is the future of this movement that we're seeing now going to be articulated by the Labour Party it's like, no, because they're not a reflection of each other. You know, this is right now, the Labour Party I see is something I could, cannot be a member of. It's something, it's a source of deep pain. You know, this is not a safe space for me as a, as a, as a woman of colour, because I see people who mock me, who harass me, who call me, who joke about our voices who call us angry black women they are out there now taking the knee <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and saying oh we oh i'm so traumatized i'm traumatized that poor black people are going through this and you're like you did it you did yeah. it this isn't about your pain jess phillips i'm gonna single you out jess bloody phillips <laughs> How dare she? I've got to show this tweet just quickly, Graham. I got—I won't show you, but I've got to edit it into the video. So here is a tweet. I mean, this is beyond parody by the Labour MP Jess Phillips, who manages somehow to make the entire Black Lives Matter movement about her personal pain. So let's just take a look at that. And now we can see how Jess Phillips treated Diane Abbott. Remember, Diane is a colleague of Jess's. Diane Abbott is the first black woman MP in this country. And this is how Jess Phillips treats her in public. Jess's favorite Diane Abbott? <coughs> Roberts. 
Well, but we really have to unite around it's Jeremy. Really yeah. And if Jess <laughs> cannot unite around Jeremy, this is sort of like then penis. she <laughs> will be hearing from my friends, <laughs> Big Frank and Harry the Hatchet. <laughs> because we really need to have a talk so about so uniting good. around Jeremy. Are you feeling quite scared over there? So no, I, can't, I don't feel confident that the party of Jess Phillips and Yvette Cooper, who's another grandstanding um, liberal fake ally, don't see how this is going to be the, the solution for us. And I don't actually see why any of us should be expected to expel our emotional energy and our time for people who have so clearly demonstrated their absence of respect and solidarity with us. Well, I agree with you, but Graham won't. No. Um, well, I don't disagree with you about the individuals you've mentioned, but whether the Labour Party can come up to a historic task is still too early to say. Because if this movement is going to get anywhere, it's in the streets, and it's... To achieve, to achieve power, it can't just remain in the streets, just remain in the streets, it's got to find a political expression. Now, what, what political expression, whether in the Labour Party or, or what else, is too early to say, so I don't write it off. Now, is this the voice of a kind of an old 71-year-old Marxist who spent all his life in the Labour Party, or is it the voice of somebody who suffers from all the limitations of a white man? That's the question. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I, actually, I actually think, no, I mean, I do agree, but I mean, I actually do think that, you know, people who, what I don't think there's any point of is staying in the party and being silent. Yes. Yeah. Don't, don't do it. I won't. No, no, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking to people. If that's what you're going to do, don't do it. There is mm. no point in you being there at all. Mm. You know, there's the one point in being in the Labour Party, and that's to speak out. And then when they suspend you or expel you, then you leave and you organise outside of it and you still keep putting pressure on because exactly mm. what Graham says, you know, we can't underestimate what Black Lives Matter in this country has already done. Mm. They're taking down pictures of slavers in the Bank of England. <laughs> People are talking about the Black Holocaust. Can I just say, I was, talk I was expelled for talking about the African Holocaust. Mm. I've been talking about the, Black, the African Holocaust for many, many years. I have been asking left groups to urgently hold conferences on race for probably 10 years now. Mm. So what we've got to make sure is that this doesn't go away for the left. Ignore the right. The right will just yeah. take the knee and they'll do it in their living rooms with their ties on and they'll do it while criticizing <laughs> the people who are actually dragging the statue. Let them play their silly games. <laughs> Let the BBC get all these apologists up to speak for black people. Do you notice who they get up to speak for black people? Because I notice who it is. Let them play their games. Mm. What we have to do is actually keep on feeding in to what is a radical move. And if all it has done, and it won't be, mm. is to actually get the whole issue of raising awareness of the black holocaust of, of enabling people to talk and discuss why is it that we don't commemorate this Holocaust, mm. but anything after the Nazis is commemorated. And I still, as yet, haven't had a response. The only response I'm given to that question is to be told I'm an anti-Semite. Mm. I would love somebody to give me the reason mm. why the... The, the Belgian Congo that happened 30 years before the Nazis came to power is outside of the remit of Holocaust Memorial Day. Mm. I would also like someone to explain to me what's happened to the representation of African Caribbean people on Holocaust Memorial mm. Day, for example, or on the EHRC. 
yeah. who's just about to make a judgment about racism. Where are the African Caribbean specialists and academics there? Mm. Because I can't see them. They're not there. I mean, that's the reality, isn't it? Is that they're just simply not there. So we've been talking quite some time. Thank you both for the generosity of giving us so much time so that our audience can get to know you. I guess I'd like to close out really with, I'm conscious that people are going to be quite scared right now and intimidated. And for some people, they might just be waking up to this situation. Like there are a lot, I, I don't know about you, but I am noticing a lot of really fresh little baby white allies who've, you know, They've, they've yeah. you know, not been people who've been overtly racist before, um, but they haven't fully grasped that they live in a, an epidemic of racism. Yeah. And they have been historically ignorant and oblivious. Um, yeah. And they are now coming to, and it's like a slap in the face for them. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out, how can I be an ally? How can I be helpful? How can I contribute to this in a way that is both productive, but also respectful? And I guess I'd like to ask, ask you, Jackie, what message would you give to those people? Stop being silent. You know, when you see a black person being derided in a Labour Party move, uh, meeting, putting forward their point of view, and this happens regularly, I have to tell you, stop being silent. When you see that statue being brought down, help pull it down. <laughs> When you're talking to your MP, make this the most important subject that you're asking them about. Yeah, Graham. I'll say two things. Speak truth to power and connect, connect, connect with all other layers of struggle. Yeah. And intersectionality really is key here. You know, as I know it's, this is one of the safest environments. It's really a joy when you're with people that you know get this on a visceral level because sadly a lot of people still don't. And it's yeah. like all these movements are connected. And so you respect our individual struggles that cannot be replicated. You know, there are, there are individual struggles. But we appreciate that we, no one gets left behind like no one deserves to be first at the queue or back at the queue. We all need to be in a line, in a single line, moving all at the same time and saying nobody, nobody is in a queue. Nobody, not trans people, not black people, not there Muslims, no not Jews. Cases. No special cases. We are all there at the front. Yeah. Absolutely. So just thank you to both of you so much for being a part of this. I know this conversation is going to just be of enormous value to so many people, particularly now. Um, and I think especially those who really didn't understand what was going on with the anti-Semitism witch hunt and probably viewed it as we were told it was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, <laughs> even to question the, the validity of it, which again is gaslighting on steroids. So you've helped countless people already. I know this will help countless more. So thank you, Jackie Walker and Graham Bash. You all take care of yourselves. The canary has always been clear. Anti-Semitism, just like all forms of racism, has no place in society. And neither does using racism as a political weapon. Since we recorded this interview in July of 2020, the situation has deteriorated. Coach has been smeared as an anti semi The attacks on left-wing figures on social media has been stepped up. And of course, Starwin removed the whip from Jeremy Corbyn on trumped-up allegations with no basis in fact. What Jackie and Graham's testimony shows is the real-life impact of this witch hunt on innocent people. And it also charts one of the darkest periods in the Labour Party's history. The weaponization of anti-Semitism to shut down the left has been shameful and so far it doesn't look like it will be ending anytime soon. But there are simple actions that we can take to make a difference and central to those is solidarity. When people are acting in bad faith, we have to call them out. And if some of the supposed leaders of the left had been braver and truer at the very beginning of this crisis, 
it would never have reached this stage. And we have to remember that going forward. People like Jackie and Graham and Chris Williamson and Ken Loach have shown profound bravery through this entire period and it's on us to at least meet them halfway. If we do that, we can and we will win.